Welcome to Nashville, Music City, yeah, my city. Um, I've been here for a few years now, and there's no other place like it on the face of the earth. Um, that's what I truly believe. Um, so if you were here last night, Beyonce was in town. Um, yeah, yeah. Tonight, uh, Kevin tells me Journey is playing, as is uh, Keith Urban. And then tomorrow night, it's T-Swizzle, right? So if you, no matter what your musical taste, we've got something for you. Um, this town wrote George Jones's If Drinking Don't Kill Me, and this town also wrote All About That Bass. And in fact, Alex Stefano, who works for Big Yellow Dog that publishes um, Megan Trainer and Marin Morris is on a panel tomorrow with Bob Bolin on that music listening panel. All right, so everybody having a good time so far? When they told me, yeah, when they told me I'll be speaking at 10:45 on Friday morning, I was really elated. Um, but then I heard the mentor and the apprentice. And I went, I got to follow that. <laughs> Weren't they incredible? Yeah. Weren't they? Yeah. So I'm going to start with a little introduction about uh, basically how I got here and kind of what we're going to cover this morning. Um, so my name is Charles Alexander. Uh, about three, over three years ago, my business partner and I, Michael Sloan, started a company called Streaming Promotions. And basically what that company did, or does, is market and strategize around playlists almost wholly and specifically on Spotify. So that was over three years ago, and I'm very proud of what we built there and the work we did there. Uh, and a lot of our clients and customers came from CD Baby. Um, but Earlier this month, I exited streaming promotions and launched a brand new company called Systemic, which is a label services company for which streaming, marketing, and strategy is a huge focus. But we're also going to be involved with digital PR and general marketing and working very closely with CD Baby to help on the distribution side. And I just wanted you to be aware of that. So again, the name of the company is Systemic. This is our website. And I want to kind of run through what our goals for this morning are uh, with this presentation. So one of the first things I want to talk about is why do we care? Why do we care about Spotify? All right? So that's one of the first things we cover. And then for those of you who might not be aware, what is a playlist? And specifically, what is a playlist on Spotify? Right? And then the thing that you all came here to find out, which is how to get on a playlist right, on Spotify. And I want to also, you know, maybe at this point, mention Spotify isn't the only game in town. And really, maybe even for some of your music, Spotify might not be the right platform. But you have a lot of other options in terms of getting on playlists, in terms of getting on streaming platforms. And you might want to think about who your audience is and where they might actually live in terms of a platform. So Spotify might not be your ideal platform. I'm going to put my phone down here for a second. So how to get on a playlist. What do you do before you get on a playlist? What do you do when you're on a playlist? What do you do after you come off a playlist? Because just because you're on a playlist doesn't mean you've achieved every incredible goal you set out to do. As I'll talk about later, just being on a playlist cannot and should not be your marketing plan. All right? You, you feel me? All right. And then about halfway through this presentation, I'm going to have a couple of my colleagues come up and talk to you about how to actually build a playlist on Spotify. What are some of the more important elements? Like, 
what do you have to do? How do you create a flow? What do you need to do in terms of branding your playlists? And if you're an artist or a brand, the reason you want to create and build a playlist and market a playlist is because Spotify looks at all that stuff and it's a point of leverage for you. So if you can grow your own playlist on your artist profile, that's going to be incredibly valuable to you. So we're going to talk about that. And so, you know, and, and you should see what Jordan and Talia have in store for you. And then one of the most important things we're going to talk about is engagement and consistency. So just because you have a playlist, just because you have a Spotify artist profile, just because, just because, just because, doesn't mean anyone's going to care, doesn't mean Spotify is going to care. So what if Spotify puts you on a really low-level editorial playlist and you do nothing for engagement, and you're not consistent about putting out music, chances are you're not going to be on that playlist very long. And so what's going to happen is you'll see some traction, and then things drop off the edge of a cliff. So we're going to talk a little bit about what you need to do to keep engagement and consist consistency up. And then at the end, we'll wrap and have some time for q and I hope. So I've done this presentation a few times, or variations of this presentation. And almost invariably, all right, we run out of time. And so at the end there, I'll be like skipping through slides and running through everything. And you'll be like, what's he doing? So what I want to offer to you is if you text the word streaming without the quotes to that number, at the end of this presentation or sometime during the weekend, I'll send you a condensed version of my entire presentation so that you don't have to worry about what you missed or what you got or whatever, right? So all the information will be in that presentation. So if you go ahead and text streaming to 31996 right now, you know, you'll be sure to get that information. All right. So coming back to the story, how did all this begin for me? Around 2004, um, uh, this is an artist I manage. Her name is Keely Valentino. And we've been working together for about 10 to 12 years. And in 2004, she put out an EP um, that was an EP she had put out after about going two or three years without putting out any music. And she's a CD Baby artist, has been since the beginning. And what happened was the record or the EP came out in the fall of 2014. And we were looking for ways that were cost effective and effective to market the EP. And so we heard from different people about radio promo, about all kinds of things, things that maybe didn't fit into a budget. And that was also around the time, I don't know if you remember, but in October of 2014, Taylor Swift, to great fanfare in this town, said she was leaving Spotify. And the reason she gave for leaving Spotify was that she wasn't, that streaming wasn't paying enough. And so those of us here in the national music community all went, yes, Taylor, good job. Streaming is evil. Spotify is evil. Show them. Um, and then at the end of October, early November, um, a young artist here in town who wasn't living here then, I don't think, a guy named Ron Pope, wrote an editorial in Billboard that said, I love Taylor Swift, I love her songs, I have all her music, but I just don't understand. I put out my own music, I own all my rights, and this year I made a quarter of a million dollars on streaming platforms, mostly on Spotify. And I went, what? <laughs> so I started looking into this stuff, and I found out that there are people on Spotify who work for Spotify, who are, or who are individual users, or who are other brands that create playlists, and those playlists have huge followings. So I began to hit up the editorial staff at Spotify for three or four months straight, and I think just to make me go away, they put one of Keeley's songs from one of her first records on a playlist called Your Favorite Coffee House. Any normal, regular person would be happy. 
I wasn't. I was really upset that they didn't put music from her latest EP on your favorite coffee house. Because we have a new EP. Why would they not market and promote a new EP? And then I began to see what the results of having a song called Nashville on your favorite coffee house began to do. At this point, Keely has 14 million streams on Spotify specifically, and a whole bunch of traction on other streaming platforms. And it completely changed her life from the perspective of visibility, traction, touring, but also financially. Like she could really run her own music business at this point. So, there's a lot of rhetoric, there's a lot of talk about how streaming doesn't pay, and well, if we have time, I want to bring up a subject that came up in the last couple of weeks, if we have time. And I wanna assure you that if you own all your rights, if you own every single piece in terms of your asset, that you will see revenue. Like the mentor and the apprentice said, you know, half of a half a cent adds up over time and over streams, all right? So this is the new music business, and my training at the, in, in school at the undergraduate level was as a biologist, and I completely believe in evolution, and I believe that if you don't evolve, you die. That's, that's truly what I believe. All right, so why should we care? So, in 2017, revenues in the music business rose for the third straight year, and most of that revenue is in the, is in the streaming end of things. So globally, there were $17.3 billion um, in global revenue for the music business, and last year, 38% um, was from streaming. And this chart that was in Billboard shows you what the revenue was in 1999 and what the total numbers were. And it was almost, it was, it's all physical, and you can see the transition. And now you can see that in 2017, the total revenue is 17, and in 1999 it was 25. We're almost back to 1999 numbers, and streaming by far is driving the bus there at 6.6 .6 billion. All right, that's global. And again, revenues by segment, 38% is streaming. Uh, physical is still a big part of the music business revenue. And if you think of the business as a global business, you can understand why, right? And the top 10 markets. And as Tracy was talking about, China is a huge potential market. And even though CD Baby distributes there and stuff, uh, it still is largely untapped. And Tracy is absolutely correct in that your market is the world and you're competing against the world. Okay? Spotify has over 30, 83 million paying subscribers. Apple Music has 50 to 55 million. This slide is already out of date. I think they're closer to 90 million, and I think Apple is hovering at about 58. Um, and then I also want to talk a little bit about, very quickly, about some of the success stories on Spotify. Here in Nashville, Marin Morris, um, if you don't know who she is, um, she has that smash hit with Zed, The Middle. That song was written across, around the corner from here at the Hutton and produced there. Um, and she's amazing, but you know, there are other sort of great success stories as well. There's another young woman named Jillian Jacqueline now that's kind of coming up and she's blowing it up on Spotify. There are other success stories as well in this town. Ron Pope, like I, told, like, like I said before, um, He's had an amazing career because of streaming platforms, especially on Spotify. So what is the playlist? A playlist is basically a collection of songs for those of you who are from my era, in the era of mixtapes, it's basically a mixtape. It's a digital mixtape of a collection of songs that you like or think that you want to put together. And the cool thing about having a playlist is you can tell your friends about it, you can tell other people on the platform about it, and you can gain followers on a playlist, all right? And so in a little bit, we'll show you how to create one, build one, and market one. 
But this is a Spotify editorial playlist called Your Favorite Coffee House, on which Keeley spent a large, like about almost two years on, and that generated most of her 14 million streams. So who is listening? Millennials, mostly. And millennials, uh, you know, I think they're defined from being born from 1982 to 2004. They're in the 13 to 35 age group, although that age group is drifting upwards or drifting downwards a little bit based on how you define them. And why are they so important? Because millennials are the target demographic for most advertisers and advertising platforms. So they consume a lot. They're very social conscious. They, they want to learn about things. They want to consume things but they don't want to feel like they've been advertised to or that they have a bunch of stuff pushed on them. So marketing has completely changed because millennials are a desirable age demographic and we've had to learn how to market to them in a fashion that we feel is responsible, but more importantly, in a fashion where they can absorb that advertising. So, Spotify is what we call a lenient platform, which means folks who listen to Spotify or playlists on Spotify are very engaged. They, they want to be involved. They want to save music. They want to follow users, that, or follow artists, rather. They want to follow different kinds of music. They want to share that music with other people in their network. So it's a very lenient, engaged um, platform. Whereas Pandora is what you call a lean back platform, although that is specifically changing. Lean back meaning you just want to turn it on and leave it alone and let it recommend music to you that it thinks you might like. Right? Amazon, also a lean back platform. But again, that is changing. So, um, so that's why Spotify is sort of like the, not the 800 pound gorilla, but the 1200 pound gorilla. So who curates this playlist? So we talked about editorial curated playlists. That's editors and curators at places like Spotify, Amazon, Pandora, um, you know, other platforms that actually sit down and there's somebody who curates all those playlists for you, but they work for Spotify. So going forward, when I say editorial, that's what I mean. There's an editor at one of these places that's actually taking the time to put this stuff together and they're being paid to do it. Then there are also these things called branded playlists. So an example would be The Gap or H&M. All those brands have their own playlists, and their main agenda in trying to have those playlists and promote them is to forward marketing for the, for the brand or for the entity, and it can be anything. So uh, we put uh, branded playlists into the same. So H&M is in the branded playlist category. Um, but, you know, you could also have somebody like a venue, right, have their own playlist. So like Mercy Lounge, High Watt here in town does a really nice job of having their own branded playlist that some of it's related to some of the acts, some of it isn't. And then the user-generated playlist, which is a huge ecosystem on the Spotify platform where we do a lot of our pitching and a lot of our marketing too. So when you're starting out, think about getting on these smaller, mid-sized playlists that are owned by individuals. Because what that's going to do for you is create a larger footprint for you on the service. You know, be less sort of concerned about total number of streams. Be more concerned about your footprint or your, your adoption on that service. All right? So your favorite coffee house, editorial, Sad Songs is curated by a guy named Carlos who lives in Spain, and his brand is called Indie Mono. And Sad Songs, you know, I think at this point is something like 400,000 followers or something. And the reason I love this playlist is not just because you can market and promote and pitch your songs to him, but because this playlist actually makes a difference and moves the needle in terms of um, having your music heard, saved, listened to. Right. Another brand called Song Picker that does more roots, uh, indie, Americana to some extent. He lives in Germany, and this Song Picker Best Songs of playlist is one of the most influential playlists on Spotify as in the independent, user-generated playlist ecosystem. Okay, so how do, we, how do we get in touch with all these folks? 
Well, you reach out on Facebook, any of the social channels, LinkedIn, Twitter, anything you can think of. You know, it's, uh, it's very guerrilla hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, in terms of trying to find these folks and then convincing them that they should add your music or your client's music to their specific playlist, all right? And at the end of the day, it's all about relationships. That's one of the things I learned about living here in Nashville in the music business, and we try to stay true to that, and we try to um, nurture and build on those relationships so that we're not just hitting up these people just for the sake of getting our music on playlists. You know, we actually know about their families, we know about their kids, uh, we know what they like, what they don't like, we know their tastes, we, we know what songs to pitch, what songs not to pitch, um, and so on and so forth. It's like any other thing in the music business. So, what can happen? So, this is Jillian Linklater, she's an artist I manage, and she had a song, or she has a song on the platform called Magnet that came out almost three years ago, and Magnet, when we first started working on her playlist strategy, uh, went into something called Discover Weekly and Release Radar, which are some of the algorithmic playlists. And so when, when Magnet made it into the Discover Weekly and Release Radar algorithms, which are computational on Spotify, we started to see this hockey stick phenomenon back in um, 2007 in May. And you know we got to about 60, 70,000 spins. Um, over the course of the mid-April to mid-May. At the end of September of that year, in fact, it was just before I was going to go to CD Baby DIY conference in Chicago, Jillian got on your favorite coffee house, and that song just hit two to three million streams in that first couple of months it was on that playlist. And this particular song now has something like five million. This is Jillian. So one of the things you want to think about when you have your Spotify profile, if you're an artist, is do things like pin playlists to your artist pick section on your Spotify profile. We'll talk a little bit more about how to do that. But again, you want engagement. And more than anything else, in terms of doing a good thing on the platform, you want your fans to follow the profile. Don't be too sort of mesmerized by vanity metrics, like the number of streams. Oh my God, 12 million streams. And then when you come off a playlist, you got nobody else. You want to market and promote so that people follow the profile, so that people save the songs, so that people um, you know, share the music with other fans and with their friends and their network. So how to get on playlists? So this is one of my favorite slides in any presentation. Uh, and, and, and just because you don't simply walk into Mordor, um, you, one does not simply get a song on a playlist. Uh, that actually recently changed. And if you know about Spotify Artist Insights, uh, are you guys familiar with Spotify Artist Insights? OK, all right, so not, maybe not everybody. But Spotify Artist Insights is something you can get access to. It's a dashboard that deals specifically with Spotify playlists. And the way you get access to it is to get verified on Spotify. And you go to spotifyartist.com slash verification, and you apply for verification. They normally turn it around in about 72 hours to a week. But then if you're a CD Baby artist, they will do it for you. So you just go into the CD Baby dashboard, click on verification request, and it'll get taken care of. All right? So once you have artist verification, you can have access to artist insights. And this is Jillian's dashboard. I think she's here. She might not be here. She might be kind of mad at me for showing all this. Um, but she's got a song coming out in a couple of weeks. It's a cover song. It's A Million Dreams from The Greatest Showman. And when you upload the music, and we use CD Baby, the moment that song shows up in Spotify's um, back end, it will show up in Artist Insights. And then you can submit the song or it's one single at a time, you can submit this song to playlists on Spotify, right? And this is what that looks like. After you submitted it, you can choose a genre, subgenre, and all that stuff, and it tells you how you, and you gotta have a pitch, 
you gotta tell them why you think this song should be on a playlist. And you can choose the different genres and stuff. Right? That's it. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> if only it was that simple, right? So they let you submit now through the artist dashboard, and that is incredibly amazing because for a long time, people were really frustrated about the lack of the ability to do that inside Spotify and that they had to come to third-party services like us. You still have to position your music. And how do you position your music? Spotify uses something called collaborative filtering, which means that it doesn't matter what one person or three people think. It matters what an entire group of people think about your music. And it's not just fans, all right? So what makes a song appealing to a curator? Is this music culturally influential? Is it got existing traction in Spotify? You know, the music must react, connect, and scale. And the data and the analytics has to show them that the music you submitted has the potential to react with the audience. And then you need consistency. So you can't just put out one song, wait two years, put out another song, and then expect that Spotify is going to fall all over you. Right? It doesn't happen that way. So you're going to need a marketing plan. And getting on a playlist, like I said earlier, is what? Not a marketing plan. You're going to need a narrative. A narrative is a story about you or your artist or whomever you're working with that's coherent, cogent, and can give somebody an elevator pitch about who this artist is and what their music is about. You, you want to talk about your history, how much sales have you had in the past, if any. And then you want to drive traffic from your social media and from PR towards your Spotify profile. Okay? So how do you influence the stuff? Well, the music helps. That we should all start there. And then you want to do things like talk to independent user-generated playlists to seed your music. So things like Discover Weekly and Release Radar, the algorithmic things on Spotify, pick up on what you're doing. All right? And then you want to build your own playlist. You want to talk to blogs and other tastemakers in the ecosystem about your music so that they will cover your music. All right? And then your impressions and engagement on socials is really important. And if you haven't used Instagram or Instagram Story to market your music on Spotify, you should do that now. Right? So you should go there and do that. OK. So I want to quickly talk about this thing called pre-saves that we've talked about quite a bit. Uh, Show.co, which is the CD Baby-owned platform, is an incredible platform for creating pre-saves, and I'll show you what they look like in a second. There are others out there, Feature FM, there's Tone Den, that's an incredible platform for doing all kinds of marketing. There's Smart URL It, you should check that out as well. That's a free, that's a free service. Showco uh, is free, Smart URL It is free. Feature FM has a free tier, Tone Den has a free tier, and pre-save is expensive. Okay. So this is a pre-save. Ariana Grande, um, um, Sweetener that just came out, was a pre-save campaign that was really, really productive. Jeffrey James, who lives here, incredible singer-songwriter, also ran a pre-save a couple of weeks ago. And this is typically what they look like. You tell your network about it, and the day of the drop, you have people pre-save the music. The day of the release, everybody gets that music in their Spotify library. So. I created a playlist. It was called Look What Taylor Made Me Do. It didn't do so great. I now am going to bring up two uh, of my colleagues, Jordan Benedict and Talia, to talk about how they market and how they work playlists. Gonna need this. Hello, my name is Jordan Benedict. And I'm Talia. And we work with Charles at Systemic Music. And today we want to kind of tell you a little bit about this project that we've been working on called Tastemaker Music. It's kind of like our baby. We started it about a month ago, and we're in the building process of just kind of creating this place for 
artists and listeners to connect and curate playlists, but on another level that could really benefit you as an independent artist. Mm -hmm. So, Talia, what is Tastemaker? Jordan, I'm glad you asked, because Tastemaker is what she said, it's a curation hub. It's a little bit different than if you, it's kind of our brand. Like if you're an artist, you wanna make your own playlist like Charles was talking about. We do this, we found a Tastemaker um, basically just to kind of help artists such as ourselves get discovered. Thank you. <laughs> of course. So, Today we're going to be talking about the best practices for creating a playlist on Spotify. As an example, we have our Taste of Summer playlist. Mm -hmm. And so if you got one of these little cards, if you could take that out right now and follow the steps, that would be really awesome and it'll really help with understanding more what we kind of do. What we do yeah. And if you didn't get one of these cards, me and Talia will be standing at the doors after this presentation and we can hand you those out. Yes. So what makes an effective playlist? Basically, we came up with five steps here. Yes. So one, create a Spotify profile. Sounds like a no-brainer, but you, you got to do it if you want to have a playlist. Yeah. Uh, you got to make a playlist with a minimum of 25 to 30 songs, because. Yeah. Basically, we do this 25 to 30 songs will allow you to kind of move up in Spotify's ranking. If you have only 10 songs, you're likely not going to get noticed. And also an important thing is our flow, the flow of a playlist. Yes, flow is the most important part. And this is what kind of makes your playlist stand out from the rest. Because when you're on Spotify, there's thousands, probably, I don't even know, millions of playlists mm -hmm. out there that anybody can create. But what is going to draw people to want to listen to your playlist or go listen to your other playlists? Because with Tastemaker, we're making multiple playlists. We have Taste of Pop, Taste of Rap, Taste of Country, and we want to be able to cater to a diverse um, population nice. of yeah. people and listeners. Mm -hmm. And so when you're creating this playlist, you have to think like a fan or a listener and create that flow where you have the top artists like Drake, Ariana Grande. Mm -hmm. People that will bring that attention to the playlist. Yeah. Exactly, those people that you already know people like. Mm -hmm. And then you can add like some artists and bands locally or people that you mm -hmm. know, that you know will support you and your playlist as well. Mm -hmm. And so that will get the word out. Um, and also put on the music you like because you yeah. want to show your fans what music you like. Yeah, we'd be lying if we said that we didn't put ourselves on these playlists. We're both artists, so I mean, you, this is what it's all about. But as far as flow, if you've ever seen playlists where they have like, you know, it's like sleep, like time to sleep or whatever, and they have like a bunch of, of like this yeah. songs from the same artist or something, and you're like, okay, well, I'm gonna have to play this on shuffle, I guess. We, that's important. Yeah, you gotta make sure that like the, each song flows into the next. Mm -hmm. You're getting a little bit of everything, so it's yeah. not like Drake, 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 yeah. Drake. I mean, like sometimes I just listen to like all Drake, yeah. but like, so different but moods. when you're making a playlist, you wanna be thinking about who's gonna be listening to it. Yeah. And then five, we have branding, and six, we have marketing, which sound really official, but it's pretty no-brainer. As far as branding goes, um, for Tastemaker, we were like, we want to look professional. We want to look like a Spotify playlist. If you see a cover of a Spotify playlist, and it's just those four songs of the first four songs of the playlist, it's kind of, you know, it doesn't stand out. So we had someone help us with designing a logo, and we picked three main colors, pink, yellow and purple, and kind of tried to stick to that. And basically, this helps you just kind of, it's, it helps your visual identity. You want to have a visual identity. You want to have a vibe that is recognizable to the audience. And just like if you are an artist creating a playlist to pin to your profile, you kind of want to connect that with your vibe as an artist so that fans can see that you're really serious about your branding along with your playlist branding, and Spotify will see that too, which gives you leverage, just like Charles was saying. Mm -hmm. So here are a few of our cover arts for uh, Tastemaker. As you can see, it's super easy to do if you can make your, if you're, an, if you're an artist, just basically get a nice picture of yourself. You don't even have to put a font on there. Just have something that looks clean and nice. Something that pops. Yes. Okay, and so marketing, super important if you want anyone to listen to your playlist, right? What we cannot emphasize enough, utilize your existing network. Be annoying. 
literally be so annoying. Post about it, talk to your friends. Like, we're gonna be annoying after this and we're annoying giving you these cards, but yeah. that's what you gotta do. Make friends, like we're all artists here. We should all support each other. And um, using that network, they could post on their socials. And especially if you're including other artists and bands on your playlist, they can be like, hey, like shout out to so-and-so for putting me on their playlist. Mm -hmm. And yeah, then it's kind of that come to the gig analogy. If exactly. you have a gig, if you're curating a, a, a lineup for your gig, you want to have a few anchor artists who are guaranteed to bring out a big crowd, but you also want to have those people that you know will just blab about it everywhere. Um, so yeah, it's just about being strategic that way. And of course, Facebook and Instagram ads are a very useful tool. And I know Rick Barker is speaking at this conference, I think tomorrow on Facebook and Instagram ads, you guys should check that out. It'll be really uh, useful information. And um, of course, shameless self-promotion. Speaking of which, um, follow us on our socials. We are a tastemaker. Uh, we have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, website. Like Charles said, text streaming to 31996. Um, very helpful. We'll be giving you all this info. And um, yeah, and as far as Tastemaker goes, we also have a way for you to submit our music to us. Yes, yeah, so let us help you mm -hmm. and help us by submitting your music to us <laughs> on our website, tastemakermusic.com. You can just submit your email, your name, your Spotify URL, mm -hmm. just a little description, nothing crazy. We yeah. listen to all the submissions and we are trying to place music on our playlist and mm -hmm. so we are super open to yes. all of your guys's music and we're excited to hear so please submit and um thank you very much for yeah. listening and thank, thank you charles you. nice job so that was talia's first presentation in a public forum That was Jordan's second presentation in public forum. And they can't have my job. Um, so they really worked hard on this. They know what they're doing. They are, it, don't let them fool you. They're completely hooked into their own networks. And I think the first week Tastemaker was live, they got all our socials up, like, you know, 100, 200 followers, whatever. And I was like, how y'all do this? It's like, I'm in marketing and I don't know how. <laughs> so hire your next marketing team. Um, so we talked briefly about what to do during and after uh, and even before. Things like blogs really help get the word out of what you're doing. Um, SoundCloud, by the way, is a great platform after you've released music to make things public. It's another form of discovery. I would think about that. That has an influence on Spotify platforms. Um, Rob Drapkin, one of our clients, um, did an amazing job doing things like shout outs when he was added to playlists. He lives in Colorado and he went to Red Rocks, did a shout out at Red Rocks, took a picture and posted it and tagged the curator. That, that curator, every time he sees me now, is like, that Rob Drapkin guy, he's amazing. So I don't even know if he still remembers the song, but he remembers this. Right. Facebook ads, Rick. Rick Barker's talking tomorrow. It's going to be great. You should learn how to do this properly. Um, and then there's this thing called Spotify Ad Studio. You can go get your own account. It's an audio ad facility that lets you advertise to, uns to free tier users on the Spotify platform. Go check out Spotify Ad Studio and figure out how to do it. Uh, Hype Machine is an indexing site for blogs. And blogs that are indexed in Hype Machine are monitored by the Spotify curation team. SoundCloud, like I said, great platform. This is a site called Chartmetric. Outside of Spotify Artist Insights, it lets you monitor what playlists you're on, what playlists you came off, and some of these playlists aren't necessarily Spotify branded playlists, but they are any playlists out in the ecosystem. I think someone from Chartmetric is around this weekend. Uh, you should try to get a free account at the very least. So the important metrics, don't worry about the vanity stuff, the number of followers. That's what's most important, right? Number of saves to your song. 
asking your peeps to save your song to their specific libraries is so incredibly useful and critical. So don't get, again, you know, um, sort of mesmerized and infatuated with the number of streams. Do the hard work. Have people follow, follow your profile, save the song, and then the number of monthly listeners is also an important indicator of what kind of adoption you have on the platform. And then skip rates, you don't have access to this, but Spotify does. So you want everyone to at least listen to 30 seconds of your song. If they, if they bug out in under 30 seconds, that's considered a skip and it counts against you in the Spotify algorithm. So it's not streams, it's engagement. Do everything you can to be engaged on the platform and drive traffic from off the platform to the platform. That, by the way, applies to Apple Music as well. It applies to Pandora as well. It applies to Amazon as well. Okay? Again, ad managers. Again, engage your audience, and then you should see a growth in your audience if you do all these things and these best practices. Let's skip through these really quickly. Engagement and consistency is really important. Don't put out song the week before you're all hyped up, the week after you're all hyped up, and then you just forget about it. This is a 365 day, 24 hour a day job, and you need to be on it and engage, and if you need help, get help. You need a team. I, one of the most important things I've learned this last year, this last three years, is that you need a team to do this, right? Can I hear an amen? amen? And not everyone in your team needs to be paid right off the bat, right? You just want people who are passionate about your music to help you out. So find a team, find help, don't kill yourself. Right? So Love, one of the biggest acts on Spotify in probably the last three years, incredible traction, completely independent, and is crushing it. Chance the Rapper, completely independent, still. And he's had offers of like, I think the last number I heard was what? 30 million, 40 million to sign? And he was like, why would I do that? I'm making more on my own. So I'm gonna come back to the money thing in just a second, but we have under 10 minutes left, and I just wanna to get to questions at this point. Is that cool with you guys? Yeah? Nashville isn't really this quiet. Okay, so quickly acknowledgement, Michael Sloan, my former business partner at Streaming Promotions, my former team at Streaming Promotions, especially the pitch team, my new team at Systemic, Jordan Benedict, Talia Stewart, and then Keely Valentino and Jillian Linklater, my, my artist clients who kind of enabled this whole thing for me to begin with. Um, I'm Charles Alexander, and it's Q&A, and go for it. Yes, I, I think you should. I think eventually you want to get people on the Spotify platform as you want to grow that particular audience just because it's impossible to ignore. That being said, if you have a sweet spot right now, and I don't know what your age demo is or where they're all listening, if you figure out the data piece of that, so for example, let's just say you figure out that Pandora is your biggest platform then you certainly want to work the Pandora thing with their AMP tool and all that business to kind of grow that audience while all the while growing your Spotify and Apple Music uh, impressions and adoption. So yeah, focus on one, but work on all four. There was one question here. Yeah. So how do you, uh, I'm sorry, we, we, we great to get everyone on mic. Okay. Okay. Sir, there with a the hat. That would be you. I'm great, thank you. Uh, I'm Richard McDesey. My organization is Empower Music and Arts, and uh, we focus on we focus on bringing artists and songs together that have messages of personal transformation, social change, sure. and justice. We want to bring them under one umbrella with the purpose of possibly even creating a Grammy category for uh, positive music at some point. And uh, we have our 14th annual Empower uh, Posse Awards coming up, and we were. Um, represent dozens of artists, thousands of songs. So I'm wanting to create a playlist to bring all of these sure. artists. Over. And 
So would there be, uh, my question is, how would I do that? So get on Spotify, yep. create a profile for your brand or your organization for or whatever organization. it is, right? Create a profile for that brand. So it's very easy. You can do a free account or you can do a paid account. And then you just start curating playlists. It's as easy as that. The, the hard part is the marketing and the branding and the promoting, right? right? That's the work part. But the other part is easy. So I could put positive music under one umbrella and then have the categories of Correct. different things just like the different jo playlists. Yeah, just like Jordan and Talia have got, it's, it's tastemaker, but then there's taste of whatever different genres. I got so, you. Yeah. All right, awesome. Thanks. Awesome, great. Hi, my name is Arnold. I have a question. I don't know whether you can answer that, but maybe you can tell me where I could find the answer to it. How do normal people, not artists like us, use Spotify? Do people generally subscribe to playlists? Do they more uh, search their own favorite artists? Because what you're saying, for example, would not really apply to me as a listener. I use Spotify since it came out. I look for the specific artists I like, yeah. put it in a playlist for myself and listen to the albums of stuff that I like. Yeah. I don't go to random playlists. I don't even look for random playlists. So where can I find out how the majority of Spotify users actually use Spotify? Yeah. So. One of the most visible playlists on the platform is this thing called New Music Friday. It's New Music Friday Day. And Alex Benjamin's Death of a Hero, which is on top of the New Music Friday playlist today, is an amazing song. You should go hear it. But New Music Friday is a very popular playlist. Uh, your favorite coffee house, a lot of people who hang out in coffee houses and work or you know, do whatever uh, listen to that playlist. So there's sort of like rap caviar if you're into hip hop. That's like a, it's probably the most influential playlist in music anywhere uh, for whatever reason right now. Um, but then there's this thing called Discover Weekly and Release Radar that is created for each user on, Pro, on, on Spotify. It's an algo, what they call an algorithmic playlist, and it knows your tastes. And let me just tell you, Discover Weekly gets me. So that's how a lot of people are discovering music on the platform. Over here. Uh, you know, I'm lucky with Pandora. I've got like 95 million streams there, but yeah. Spotify struggles. I struggle with Spotify. Yeah. So what I wanted you to do is to give me just a tiny bit more information on the Spotify ad. Oh, also, uh, using services to try to promote playlists is yes. a, a no-no, right? It's an absolute... Well, you, you can't, you're not, it's against the terms of service yeah. to pay a playlist curator to add your music to a playlist. I thought it was against service, uh, terms of service to also hire a company to promote mm -mm. too. Nope. No, it's against, it's against the terms of service to add, to, to pay a curator okay. to, to add music, but people are doing that anyway. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay. All right, can you give me more information on the Spotify ad studio? I didn't quite get everything. Yeah, you... can we have that conversation offline? Sure. That's, yeah, thanks. Go. I'm Leah Meneker from Philadelphia. Um, so my thing is, this is all great information. I have it all written down, ready to go, you know, go deeper. But I, I'm wondering if you can give some suggestions on, you know, you get overwhelmed. So you say, okay, first I need a team. Then you say, I haven't written a song in forever. And then you say, I haven't even touched Spotify now. And then you didn't make any movement because you're so focused on all the pieces that, you know, where do you begin and how do you set a strategy for that? Yeah. Um, I am in the same boat as you are, from, as an artist's perspective, so I get it, right? I think the first piece is, I think what all of us need to do is connect back with the joy of creating. Once you have that, and once you're, right? Yeah, yeah. Once you have the joy of crea creating back, and once you see how much people want to hear what you do, that's gonna fuel everything else. All this other stuff I'm talking about is really step two, three, four, 102, right? Step one is get back in touch with the music and your love for it. And I think that's gonna drive everything else. Just my opinion. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hey. First, I wanted to say thank you for coming and speaking to us today. Really appreciate oh. it. Secondly, I would like to say, um, Follow my playlist, everyone. Indie Beach Day playlist. What's your That's playlist? Mine. Indie Beach Day playlist. It's okay. really awesome. Chill vibes. Indie music. Shameless self-promotion right so there. I want to throw that out there. 
Um, but as a band manager, I just wanted to know if you had any tips to putting together a really good pitch for your song for a playlist. It's going to be about your story, man. Like, I, I think th that's the thing I think a lot of people struggle with. And once you solve that nugget, I think everything else flows. Like, just like I said, the joy of creating is one. But two, I think, is who are you? What are you about? What's your narrative? What's your story? I think we all, without exception, even that guy in the White House, wants a story. You know? <laughs> Good, bad, and different, they want a story and get your story right, everything else is gonna fall. Okay, thank you. Hey, man. Hi, John Stringer from John Stringer Inc. and Healing Arts Management. Uh, check me out on John Stringer, it's on Spotify. Um, quick question for you. Yeah. So, if you're an artist and you have a niche, uh, we represent a couple of artists who are also positive music artists, but let's say you're jazz, R&B, whatever. You have a niche, you figured it out, yeah. and you wanna actually do the do it yourself pitching you talked about. Find those playlists, medium to small size playlists to develop your footprint on Spotify. Where do I go? Do I just search in like positive music and look for playlists like that? I mean, where can you find the, the right targets? Right, so if you go into Spotify, there's a search bar, right? You just plug in positive or uh, uplifting or inspiring or inspirational. So right? basically try keywords in Spotify search and that's your best route? Spotify is really a subset search engine. Got it. Okay. Right? So, cool. SEO. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to stop. I'll get your question after. I just want to quickly say something that's really important. In the last, in, for, in the entire time I've been doing this, there's been rhetoric and hype about how streaming services don't pay. In fact, just in the last two weeks, one of the most famous guitarist artists in the world talked about how he had 55 million streams on streaming platforms and got paid only $1,500. I say this with all due respect, that's complete BS, all right? 55 million streams on Spotify at least should earn you $250,000 and on the writing and mechanical side, each piece should be paying you $25,000. So that's a $50,000 nut. If you're getting paid $1,500 on a $25,000 nut, you have a sucky deal. Get a freaking attorney, all right? So one of the best attorneys in town is that guy over there, Eric Griffin. You need to talk to him if you've got streaming payout problems. So we're out of time. I will take whatever questions you might have outside in the lobby. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I'm Charles Alexander. These are the ways you can get in touch with me. Thank you so much.